Catastrophe strikes in the heart of Minnesota. It lifted my car up, I heard a loud boom, and I thought, that's it, that's it. A detonation disaster in downtown Dallas. Are you serious? What the heck is going on here? In Denmark, a rail tragedy on a cutting edge crossing. One of the most fatal and tragic uh, accidents uh, in, in Danish train history. It was horrific. And in Iowa, a devastating dam failure threatens an entire community. You don't have a minute. You need to get out now. With big builds, even the smallest mistake can be a huge disaster. From miscalculations to misunderstandings, some with deadly consequences. These catastrophes are every engineer's worst nightmare. Bridge engineers are in a constant fight with gravity. Every joint, angle, and dimension has to be perfect. Even a small miscalculation can cause a major disaster. Like this bridge failure in Minnesota, a fatal collapse on one of the state's busiest crossings. Seeing it crumbled in the river was nothing like I'd ever seen before. This rush hour disaster revealed a deadly design flaw. I thought I was gonna die, and you just waited for that wave of concrete to gobble you up and to take you away. The tragedy left everyone asking, why did it fail so catastrophically? <laughs> Minneapolis, the name means waterfall city, and it thrived thanks to America's most iconic river. Stacy Bengs is a local journalist. Minneapolis was built around the Mississippi River. There's so much life and color in the city. It's a source of recreation, but more importantly, the city is built around the power of the Mississippi River. All that power carved a gorge through the land, and as the city grew, so did the need to cross the river. Minneapolis now has more than 20 bridges crossing the Mississippi. Without them, the city would grind to a halt. The St. Anthony Falls Bridge is one of the busiest. It carries I-35 over the Mississippi, a crucial connection on an interstate running from Minnesota to the Mexican border. In 1964, construction started on the original eight-lane crossing, the I-35 Mississippi River Bridge. Engineer Dr. Matt Rouse is a bridge research specialist. So the I-35 bridge in Minneapolis was designed and built in the 1960s. The style of bridge, this deck truss, the basic structure of the bridge has two of these large trusses which are parallel to each other, and they support the deck that the traffic moves on. Each 325-meter truss was a lattice of horizontal, vertical, and diagonal steel members, all connected by multiple gusset plates. This gusset plate is a steel plate that connects several of these truss members that all meet at a certain point. So for example, there's a gusset plate right here, right, which is bolted or riveted to all of the individual truss members. And that gusset plate holds those members together. And if the stress gets too high on that gusset plate, it can rip or tear. Gusset plates are found in all kinds of steel structures, not just bridges, but stadiums, uh, television masts, even the Eiffel Tower. They're like the glue that hold these huge objects together. The 35W Bridge opened in 1967 and for four decades carried more than 100,000 vehicles a day over the Mississippi. The 35W Bridge connects people, it connects life. It's part of the heartbeat of Minneapolis. On August the 1st, 2007, construction workers and cement tankers were on site, waiting to resurface the bridge. Four of the eight lanes were closed. Andy Gannon was driving across town. 
That day I was heading to the wake of a coworker of mine whose father had passed away. And when I got on the bridge, got on a little bit, and the first thing I heard was a loud boom, and the bridge moved lateral. And I thought, well, that was weird. I thought maybe that was a barge that hit one of the beams in the water. But this was no barge. At 6.05 p.m., motion sensors triggered a surveillance camera. The 40-year-old bridge failed without warning. So you watch the bridge buckle up and lifting cars up and some of the cars falling down over the sides. It lifted my car up. I remember being up above everybody, heard a loud boom that was the bridge coming back down. Almost 140 meters of the central span dropped into the river. We all free falled and just rode it down and my life flashed before me and uh, definitely thought that was, that was gonna be it. More than 100 cars went down with the bridge. For about three to five seconds, it was the most eerie quiet, the most eerie silent. And at that moment, I actually thought I had died. Deputy Fire Chief Don Leadham was on duty when the call came in. 35W Bridge is right off to our left. And normally it looks like that. But on that particular day, the cement kind of had a horizon line. And you couldn't see the part that actually went over the river because it didn't exist anymore. It was like, nah, that can't really be it. As Don and the fire crew arrived, the scale of the disaster hit home. It became evident that they were, they were going to be going into a very fluid situation. The bridge had just collapsed. It by no means seemed like it was stable at the time. We still had cars up on top that were letting loose and sliding down and falling off the ledge. Journalist Stacy Bengs also witnessed the devastation firsthand. I only lived about three or four blocks away and I heard and felt something. Somebody even asked, did you guys feel that? And I looked out my balcony and I saw the fracture sticking up in the smoke. I was in complete shock. And my gut instinct was just to get my cameras and go there. Nearly 200 people had been on the bridge when it fell. It was a race against time to rescue them. It was shocking and it was unbelievable to see. I was calling my wife to say goodbye. I thought for sure I was going to die. Um, if, I could, if, I could, if I could get her on the phone for even two seconds to say I love you, um, that would be good enough for me. Not everyone was as lucky as Andy. 145 people were injured. Tragically, 13 died. The nation was left asking just what had gone wrong. It's haunting to this day when I think about what people on the bridge went through when that went down. I think we were all just kind of in a collective shock. In the wake of the disaster, an investigation was launched to discover why the bridge had collapsed and why so suddenly. One question was whether the combination of construction equipment and heavy rush hour traffic was to blame. These added more than 600 tons of weight to the center span. But that in itself shouldn't have triggered the collapse. Detailed inspection of the CCTV delivered a crucial clue. By analyzing the footage, investigators were able to pinpoint exactly where the fail started. And they discovered it was a specific set of gusset plates, the very things that held the bridge together. The first part of the bridge to fail was identified on the south side of the central span, with gusset plates known as the U10 node. The steel plates were found to have buckled and fractured completely. As the bridge dropped, the exact same plates on the north side cracked, and the center span was doomed. Bridge specialist Dr. Matt Rouse explains. This type of bridge is very non-redundant. So if there is a localized failure which causes one of the trusses to fail, the whole bridge comes down. So why did these critical plates fail? 
investigators uncovered a tiny but crucial design flaw in the original plans. This gusset plate that we're talking about that failed is about 10 feet wide and six feet high. It's a huge piece of steel. And it, this one in particular that failed was about a half inch thick. And according to the code and the design standard, it should have probably been closer to an inch in thickness. It did not meet the standards of the day, and it certainly didn't meet the standards of today. That small miscalculation ultimately proved catastrophic. And yet the bridge had stood firm for 40 years with the flaw hiding in plain sight. City historian Laurie Williamson explains. This is an infamous gusset plate from the 35W bridge over the Mississippi River that collapsed in 2007. I think it was a combination of design flaw from the get-go, of it not being thick enough, but I also think that there was a lot of wear and tear on it that weakened it to a point where it ultimately failed. Decades of pounding by traffic and the weight of construction equipment proved to be a lethal cocktail. It was a perfect storm of all the right combinations. It couldn't take it and the whole bridge came down. The city was in mourning, but the I-35 was a vital link and had to be replaced. On September 18th, 2008, just over a year after the tragedy, the new 10-lane St. Anthony Falls Bridge opened to traffic. This time, engineers weren't taking any chances. Bridge engineering had come a long way in 40 years. Instead of a fracture critical steel truss, which risked collapse if one plate failed, the new bridge uses multiple concrete girders, meaning it's a much more robust, safer crossing. So for example, instead of two major structural elements of two parallel trusses, we might have several parallel beams, each which supports a smaller portion of the deck. And the idea there is that with, the more, with more redundancy, uh, the consequences of a local failure are much smaller. Minneapolis was on the move once more. But lessons from the failure continued to reverberate through the engineering community. This bridge collapsed. Departments of transportation all around the country suddenly scrambled to increase their inspection programs, especially bridges of similar design, to make sure that they didn't have um, a similar situation on their hands that had gone undetected. It was a reminder of the risks in older infrastructure. In Minnesota, inspectors now assess fracture-critical bridges at least every two years. What I've taken from this situation is really a broader look on life and my own life and what really truly matters, what really doesn't matter, because when you come close to dying, at that moment I remember going, I don't want to die because I'm not done. Every engineer knows that careful planning is the key to success. But sometimes even the best laid plans go disastrously wrong. Like this calamity in Texas, where a routine detonation turned to disaster. When you're using well over 100 kilos of dynamite, you really hope you've got things right. An explosion that made headlines for all the wrong reasons. Are you serious? What the heck is going on here? And a building that just wouldn't go away. Safe to say, this demolition didn't go to plan. Dallas, Texas is a big city with a southern can-do attitude. Journalist Sean O'Neill explains. The symbol of Dallas is a pegasus. It's an ordinary creature that becomes extraordinary. It's a workhorse that sprouts wings and flies up above everybody else. And that's Dallas in some ways. Dallas might have a reputation for its oil and its cowboys, but there's a lot more to this city than meets the eye. Dallas made its bones in oil, but oil is just one of the many things. It's just got its hand to just about everything. It's always out there every day just selling itself. One of Dallas's boldest marketing ideas grew out of the long, baking hot summers. In the 1920s in Dallas, you had this place called the Southland Ice Company, and they were just selling ice out of their storefront. One of the employees, this guy named John Jefferson Green, 
he realized that you know he could sell milk and eggs and bread and that sort of stuff out of their storefront. It was a convenience for people. The idea quickly caught on and by 1946 was spread across Texas, renamed 7-Eleven. They decided after World War II to change their name to reflect the hours that they were open. By the 1960s, 7-Elevens were everywhere. In the 1970s, this fast-growing company needed a brand new headquarters. Built around three kilometers north of downtown, in typical Dallas style, it would be bold and strong at heart. Thomas Taylor was the principal design engineer. These are the original plans, and they were completed in 1971. I had this idea as a young engineer to make something more out of it than just a standard routine building. So we came up with the concept to actually use the facade, the, the expression of the building, actually use that as structural. Standing around 48 meters tall, the outside of the 11-story tower would be built from precast concrete panels and steel. But its real strength would come from within, supported by a solid cast-in-place concrete core that would both stabilize and provide structural rigidity. The whole purpose of the concrete core was to tie all the precast and steel floors with steel beams to the concrete core so they won't fall over. If this were a tree, that would be the tree trunk. These days, precast panels can be made strong enough to play a structural role. But back in 1971, they were mainly cosmetic. So this building's solid concrete core was essential. The primary purpose is to keep it from blowing over. It's a 11 story building with a plus a basement, so the wind pressures are pretty high. So obviously a core is extremely important because it's the whole lateral stability of the building. By the 80s, 7-Eleven had moved on, and in 2020, the tower was scheduled for demolition to make way for a $2.5 billion redevelopment. Built in the 70s, so, you know, that's 50 years ago, so that it had a good long life. Sunday, February the 16th, 2020, demolition day. There's two ways to demolish a building. One is just knocking it down with heavy balls or something, but then the other is to implode it. More than 100 kilograms of dynamite were primed and ready to go. When that first implosion hit, it took down everything else. It took down the steel bars, the windows, all the kind of frippery, if you will, and it just left this solid concrete core. Built to withstand hurricane force winds, the core had just stood up to more than 100 kilos of explosives, shaken but still standing. The core only dropped around 10 meters and was left with a tilt of 15 degrees. That's more than the leaning tower of Pisa. Local street artist Gerald Sustaita knew that this was too good an opportunity to miss. My brother called me and he said, uh, hey, did you hear about the leaning tower? I said, well, yeah, I know the leaning tower. Everybody knew. No, no, the one in Dallas. I said, what? So I came out here and the spectacle was something that I, I just had to, to capture. I hadn't seen anything like that. As Gerald memorialized the catastrophe on canvas, the core quickly became known as the Leaning Tower of Dallas. It became a real tourist attraction. People started going to it specifically to take photos like you would in Italy with the Leaning Tower of Pisa, you know, pretending to hold it up or kick it over or whatever. The Dallasites kind of were fond of it. You know, this is our leaning tower. It was a fun time. One of them started a petition asking for it to be made a UNESCO World Heritage Site. There were calls to make it a permanent tourist attraction. Obviously, there's a lot of safety concerns with that sort of thing. But how had a supposedly routine demolition gone so spectacularly wrong? 
Engineers build structures to last, not fall over. So when you're planning to use explosives to bring one down, it's crucial to know exactly what you're blowing up. That's kind of how we built it back then. We didn't build them to make them easy to demolish. It seems the core might have been stronger and more stable than expected. This wasn't news to the tower's principal engineer. I wasn't surprised that the core was hard to come down. If they didn't have a proper number of charges or if the timing was bad or maybe a charge didn't go off at the exact time it was supposed to go off, maybe they undersized their charges, I don't know. One explanation was that the dynamite would blast the precast concrete and steel floors while cutting the core off at its base, toppling it to the ground like that tree. But one thing they might not have bargained on was the basement. If you look at it closely, it looks like it fell in the basement. So it actually did fall down. And I think maybe the rubble of all of this other stuff that was in there was surrounding the core. And so when it tried to fall over laterally, the rubble around it is probably what contained it and prevented it from being able to fall over. The core was wedged in and leaning at around 15 degrees. So on February the 24th, eight days after the blast, it was time for plan B, the wrecking ball. If they needed 135 kilos of dynamite to blow it up, you'd think they would need a giant wrecking ball too. But think again. To take down the 11-storey concrete core was a 2,500-kilogram wrecking ball, just over one metre high. There was a silence in the crowd. And then there was the, a great exhale of, what the heck is going on here? Are you serious? Is that what they brought? What Dallasites were witnessing wasn't blowing them away. But I don't know how big a wrecking ball you can actually get, but you know, especially from a distance, it just looks like this little like cannonball just taking pot shots at this building. Literally, it looks like my paintbrush coming up to the side of the building here, and then. The ball would just bounce off of it and just bounce off of it. And eventually the local news set up like a live stream. You could watch it 24 hours a day. All day long. That wrecking ball might have looked underwhelming, but at least it got the job done, eventually. On the afternoon of March the 2nd, 15 days after the blast, the Leaning Tower of Dallas finally leaned no more. It was over. It was done. Everybody stood around, everybody that was there. All that was left was just a pile of rocks. With the land now leveled, and despite the calamity, the Leaning Tower left a lasting impression on the city. It brought the community together and it allowed us to focus on something that was outside of ourselves. And one thing is for certain, the core was definitely up to the job. It does kind of prove that it was strong enough to resist the wind, because it knows what it was intended to do. Everybody in Dallas knows and loves the Leaning Tower of Dallas. The tower is gone, but it's not forgotten. Engineers are on a constant quest for simple solutions to complicated problems. But it only takes one oversight to turn a fix into failure. Like this railroad disaster in Denmark on one of Europe's most iconic bridges. This was a ticking time bomb. No one had any idea there was a problem until it was too late. A hidden design flaw with tragic consequences. One of the most fatal and tragic uh, accidents uh, in, in Danish train history. A deadly discovery that sent shockwaves across Europe. We warn 
the other investigation boards in Euro. This could be safety critical. Denmark. For centuries, the capital Copenhagen, on the nation's biggest island, could only be reached by boat. Stefan Jorgensen is a local journalist. Denmark is a small country separated by many islands. If you had to travel from the western part of Denmark to the capital of Copenhagen, you had to take ferries. It took hours. But then, in 1998, the Great Belt Bridge was constructed and everything changed. With a main span of just over one and a half kilometers, the Great Belt Fixed Link is the third longest suspension bridge in the world. Standing tall, this mammoth crossing revolutionized Denmark's transportation network. The Great Belt Bridge totally redefined the infrastructure of this country. So what took an hour before crossing by ferry uh, now takes not more than 10 minutes. This crucial link helped connect northern Scandinavia with the rest of Europe to the south by both road and rail. And sometimes a clever combination of both, known as piggybacking. For about 40 years, Europe has used rail network to carry road freight semi-trailers, piggybacking on specialist rail cars called pocket wagons. Instead of being towed by a truck, the trailer sits in the wagon like being in a pocket. The only fixed connection is where the trailer's kingpin slots into the rail car's saddle, with teeth that grip it in place, all secured by a locking arm. This tried and tested method was transporting freight safely across the Great Belt Bridge and into Europe for decades. January the 2nd, 2019, a 110 kilometer an hour storm was battering the coast of Denmark. The Great Belt Bridge was right in its firing line and closed to road traffic, but open to rail. Local journalist Stefan Jorgensen was on the train to work. I was crossing the Great Belt Bridge and um, approximately about uh, half past seven, uh, the train stopped in the middle of the bridge. And in, in the speakers, uh, they announced that we had to stop because a cargo train had to drop something, some kind of tarp on the tracks, and that we couldn't proceed. Chief accident investigator Bo Hanning was on duty at the time. We got a phone call from the Danish State Railways, the SB, who told us there has been some incident on the Great Belt. Maybe some passengers had got wounded a bit. It was far worse. At 7.29 a.m., a commuter train heading to Copenhagen collided with a semi-trailer hanging from a freight train. We pretty quickly found out that it wasn't just a tarp on the tracks. It was uh, a lot bigger than that. It was very serious. Moments before the incident, CCTV captured this grainy footage. The empty trailer had fallen sideways from the freight train and was being dragged into the path of the oncoming commuter train. Both were travelling at around 120 kilometres an hour. By the time the passenger train saw the trailer, it was too late. In a very few seconds, there was huge damages along both the passenger train and the freight train. 131 passengers were on board when the front carriage hit the trailer. 18 people were injured. Sadly, eight lost their lives. What started out for me and I guess many other journalists as a quite normal day quickly turned out to be an extraordinary day with one of the most fatal and tragic accidents in, in Danish train history. This accident was on one of Denmark's busiest bridges between two regular rail services. So Bo knew they had to uncover the cause of the disaster. It was important for us to find out as fast as possible what happened. Not, not only what happened, but why. For me, I can describe this as a big puzzle and we have to find all the parts to put together. 
The accident spread wreckage along hundreds of meters of track. The collision actually was just after the, where the bridge started and then the passenger train uh, broke and, and stopped a few hundred meters uh, after. And the freight train continued here on the line and actually stopped around here with the uh, locomotive just over there uh, uh, and, and with, the, with the wagons up here. The semi-trailer had been dragged sideways by the pocket wagon until it was knocked completely clear by the passenger train. Bo and his team faced a massive challenge finding evidence. It was a train with empty beer bottles in boxes. So there was glass bottles all over. So we was trying to locate which part on the, on the track was actually a part of the accident and was train part from the freight train or from the passenger train. The big question for Bo and his team was why the semi-trailer had fallen from the pocket wagon. So investigators focused on the only connection between trailer and rail car, the kingpin and saddle. We had three main scenarios. One of them was that the semi-trailer was correct loaded, but not locked. One of them was actually that it was wrong loaded. And the last scenario was that it was correct loaded, but the wind was strong enough to draw it out. Just six days after the crash, with the investigation still underway, the Danish authorities banned all pocket wagons from the rail network. Suddenly, uh, goods from going from Germany, for example, to Sweden couldn't cross in Denmark with these uh, kind of uh, wagons. These kind of pocket wagons were banned until the companies could uh, reassure the Danish authorities that uh, it was safe. To find out how the seven-ton semi-trailer had been blown from the pocket wagon, the team brought in Professors Jens Sorensen and Robert Mickelson, wind experts from the Technical University of Denmark. We used a model train, which is identical to the real train, uh, and put that into a wind tunnel to measure and test, visualize, and investigate how the, the wind was blown around the bridge and, and the train. By simulating the exact conditions on the bridge that morning, Jens and Robert discovered that strong winds, combined with the speed of the train, were enough to blow the empty trailer off the pocket wagon on one condition. We found out that a wind speed in the order of 22 meters per second was sufficient to crash this down here, provided that the king rod was not attached. The theory was tested at full scale with an empty trailer in equivalent winds, proving that if unlocked, the kingpin could be blown from the saddle. But according to reports, the kingpin had been properly locked in place. If it was locked correct and you lift in the semi trailer, it is so heavy the lock that you could lift the wagon, the whole wagon, and you don't have wind powers enough to derail both the wagon and the semi trailer in a train. On closer investigation, they discovered a previously unknown flaw in the pocket wagon system. The locking teeth on the saddle weren't always locking. The problem was really very simple. Although the operating lever looked to be locked, the teeth in the saddle weren't always fully closing around the kingpin, meaning it wasn't locked at all. And this floor was made worse by maintenance access issues. We could see that actually the maintenance of these locks was not done for several years. To be sure that the lock could work, you have to open and to lubricate the beneath of the lock to be sure all the parts inside could work, and it hasn't been done. While it's clear proper lubrication was safety critical, it wasn't mentioned in the guidelines. This is one of those problems that goes unnoticed until a disaster brings it into the light. Pocket wagons had been hurtling around Europe, unsecured, for years. The combination of the trailer being empty and exposed to high winds on the bridge revealed the problem very dramatically. With the cause of the accident identified, new maintenance guidelines for locking mechanisms were implemented throughout Europe. 
So this was one of the consequences, to be sure that other hitches of this type wouldn't have uh, risked the same failure in the future. In the wake of this accident, the rules were changed, requiring these crucial connections to be serviced regularly. So hopefully nothing like this can ever happen again. Engineers say Mother Nature always bats last. And when it comes to big construction, her strike rate can be devastating. Like this dam collapse in Iowa on a collision course with an entire town. We could be wiped out. It was scary. This is my town. What's going to happen if it's wiped away? Hundreds evacuated in a catastrophe of epic proportions. You don't have a minute. You need to get out now. An engineering mistake exposed by Mother Nature. The power of water, a single rainfall event, almost without warning, can result in the failure of a dam that's been in existence for roughly 100 years. Iowa, in the heart of America, is home to hundreds of rural communities like Hopkinton, a small town that grew up on the banks of the Maquoketa River. Kathy Harris is former mayor. Hopkinton has always been my home. It has grown. I mean, we're a population of 628 now. I enjoy the small town life. When somebody's sick, somebody needs something, we're there for them. And, and that's just the way Hopkinton is. So that's why it's so special to me. Around 15 kilometers upriver lies Lake Delhi. Now a hotspot for fishing and recreation, its dam was once a source of power for Hopkinton. Delhi Dam was built in the 1920s as a hydroelectric power station and generated electricity for about 40 years until the turbines were switched off in 1973. Engineer Randy Rattenberg is president of the dam's operating company. These are the original inlets where the turbines were. This is where the water would flow into to spin the turbines. Right now we're in the turbine room. These are original from the construction of the dam. So the purpose of these turbines was to generate the hydroelectric power, which is the reason the dam was built to begin with. Completed in 1929, the dam beside the powerhouse had a 26 meter wide spillway designed to release water during periods of high flow. The old dam had three gates. We're actually standing over the top of them right now. This area is part of the original structure built in the 20s. Holding back the rest of Lake Delhi was a 150 meter long earthen embankment, around 18 meters high, with a reinforced concrete wall at its core to anchor the dam in place. Professor of Engineering, Larry Weber, is a hydraulics expert. In many cases, there will be a portion of the dam that's concrete. Uh, that's where the structure of the dam is. And then there's a larger earthen embankment just to hold the water back. For more than 100 years, the dam controlled the flow of water to the river below, while Lake Delhi itself became one of the county's most sought after suburbs. On July 22, 2010, a heavy storm began to fall on the Makokota River. At one point, 25 centimeters fell in just 12 hours. And so there was a warning that went to communities downstream of a potential dam failure at Lake Delhi. If the dam burst, the small town of Hopkinton would be the first in its path. In the early hours of the morning, Mayor Kathy Harris received a knock at her door. It was about 6 o'clock on July 24th. I looked at my bedroom window and I see the fire chief. I said, what's going on, Craig? And he said, they think the dam is going to break. We are evacuating this area. Delhi Dam engineer Randy Rattenberg had a bird's eye view of the impending disaster. Me and another guy were up in a plane and we were taking pictures. I'm watching and I'm just like, wow, this is really bad. This is not going to go away anytime soon. Randy was right. 
At 12.49, the roadway across the dam dropped into the deluge. 11 minutes later, the entire embankment failed. All the water that was being held back from upstream went downstream. It was pretty dramatic. Around 2 million litres of water per second were now flooding down river, rocks and roads straight towards Hopkinton. There's houses that are just gone now because the ground that they were sitting on doesn't exist anymore. It's gone. As the torrent continued, the outskirts of Hopkinton were engulfed in a wall of water. When it came, it came with such a force. When you looked at it, it looked like a big ocean down here. It came over the, the road here and back through here. That is the highest I have ever seen the water. It was scary. When the flood subsided, questions were being asked. Why had this historic dam failed? Was it an act of God or an engineering catastrophe? The town could have been gone. It's just, it was scary. Something that I'd never want to live through again. In the aftermath of the disaster, an investigation was launched to find out exactly what had gone wrong. The dam's three spillway gates, designed to prevent an overflow, were the first port of call. A year before the dam burst, it was clear that one of the spillway gates needed repair. But by the time the dam broke, the works didn't appear to have been completed. They had two of the three gates opening. The third one was open partially, but it was not able to be opened completely. The investigation concluded that even a fully functioning third gate wouldn't have saved the dam. At its peak, more than two million liters of water were pushing against the dam every second. Even with all three gates fully open, the spillways could only cope with half that amount. And so that caused the lake level to rise more and a little faster until ultimately the lake level rose to a point where it overtopped the dam. Evidence in the rubble explained why the overtopping had caused such destruction in the embankment. The height of the concrete core. The concrete core in the dam was at a certain design height. The lake level rose to a point higher than that. That caused seepage to happen. And that water seepage caused some erosion to the interior core of the dam. The reinforced concrete wall was around 1.8 meters lower than the top of the embankment. As flooding made its way over the top, water eroded the earth in a process known as piping. And the whole thing started to collapse. Piping happens when fast flowing water gets into a dam or embankment, eroding soil and creating a long cavity or pipe. In some cases, it can cause a catastrophic failure of the structure. As it overtopped, the force of the water was simply too much for the 80-year-old structure to bear. This event tested that dam to a level it had never seen before. A single storm in the Maquoketa River. It was a single watershed, but in that watershed, it was devastating. In the wake of the collapse, the dam was redesigned, reinforced, and reopened in 2016. This time with an award-winning spillway, the first of its kind in Iowa, the aptly named Labyrinth. The labyrinth is kind of a zigzag shape. And this labyrinth controls the pool. And it also allows for the river just to maintain its normal flow as if this dam was never here. The shape effectively makes the spillway about three times longer than a straight design in the same space, meaning the labyrinth can pass huge amounts of water compared to the old spillway. It's a night and day comparison. There is no comparison. With this design, it's going to make it safer for the downstream people as far as not having a major catastrophic flooding event happen again. The rebirth of the dam and the lake has reinvigorated the community and the local economy. And for this area at least, we'll hopefully make the catastrophe of 2010 
a very distant memory. Hopkins could have been wiped off the map, and it wasn't. So we were very, very lucky. We just pray and hope that it never happens again. <laughs>